welcome to episode 34 of the Daddy Brigade Podcast. I'm Keith the Bearded Tank. I'm Zach the Tactical No. And we have another guest. Another guest. Another and guest. we have a guest. And an, yeah, we got Which yeah. my one guest left, but I mean, we have a guest yeah. and a guest. So, and the guest brought me another beer, which <laughs> that makes, now I have three. So, I'll, I'll wait. I'll hold on that. Yeah, just hold on. So, anyways, um, tonight we have Mike from Swamp Fox Optics. If you have not heard of Swamp Fox Optics, you need to check out who Swamp Fox Optics is. They are making some awesome, awesome scopes. Um, I've heard a lot of stuff about them. I don't have any of their products yet. Emphasis on yet. Um, but I've heard a lot about them. Um, and everything I've heard so far, I really like. So I reached out to them. Mike reached back out to me. And after talking to a couple people uh, in between, it uh, made everything work, and we actually were able to get them on the show. So, Mike, uh, go ahead and tell us a little bit about Swamp Fox Optics, and then we'll kind of get into all the different optics and everything with that. Hey, guys. Uh, glad to be here. So, Swamp Fox is in year two of operations, and we are working really hard on coming out with a wide variety of, of, of excellent products for the money. We're a value uh, company. And by that, I don't mean value means cheap crap uh, because value is a bad word for a lot of people. You know, you go to Walmart and everything's value this and value that, and it's all junk. Um, what I would say in terms of what we're doing is, is that I like to say there are three kinds of buyers in, in the U S there's the guy who likes to brag about how little he paid there's the guy who likes to brag about how much he paid. And then there's the guy who's like me who will pay different things, but he wants the most value for every dollar that he spent. And that's my guy. The other two guys are really not my customer. Um, the value guy who wants the best performance per dollar is the guy who is the Swamp Box customer. That's who we're after. Cool. So you said this is you so for Swamp Fox. I want to update. What'd you say, John? He's kind no, of. No, it's like, so that, it sounds exactly like we're in a galley of like you and me with most of our conversations with, with uh, trying to buy almost anything. Oh, yeah. We want the best for the money. That sounds awesome. What are we doing? I'm, I'm going to disappear because I'm going to go shut my door. Okay. okay. <laughs> me, and, uh, me and John work together and we both talk firearms a lot at work and, you know, it's everything from gear to optics to slings to muzzle brakes. And so that's one of the big things is what's the best quality training glasses I'm trying to get little money. Right. And there are a lot of companies out there that are kind of doing the same thing that we're doing, but in different, uh, different categories, you know, there's, I could rattle off, you know, my favorites, you know, I like uh, BCGs from fail zero and I like uh, ballistic advantage barrels when it comes to ARs, you know, I like, uh, you know, this company here and that company there that I think gives me a performance advantage, but I don't have to pay through the nose because, oh my gosh, this is the same one that the Navy SEALs have. And therefore it's, you know, a $400 muzzle device because it's made of Inconel, you know, that's, that's not really my thing. I'm not that guy. But I like being the operator who doesn't really operate operationally. And hey, if you can afford that, totally awesome. Good for you. Enjoy your Schmittenbender $3,500 scope. They're fantastic. Go for it. If that's, if that's you, that's a fantastic scope. And, you know, uh, spend that money. But most yeah, see, of most I don't have that money. As you've seen, I have a midget running around. Yeah. And he takes most of my money. Exactly. Hey, Inconel is a great, it's a great material for the inside of a, for a baffle of a suppressor. <laughs> he has a point. Um, so you said that Swamp Fox is in year two. What about you? How long have you been in the, uh, the industry? Oh gosh, I've been, I've been in and out of the industry for 10 years or so. Um, most recently I was with Primary Arms. I was with them for three and a half years. And uh, about a year ago I left and, and came from Primary Arms here to Swamp Fox. 
um, doing a lot of the same stuff that I did at PA. Uh, I still write all the user manuals and uh, help design the boxes, you know, the packaging that comes in. But the cool part about Swamp Fox that I didn't get to do before uh, is that I finally got enough experience where I'm now knee deep in the product development process, which is what's really special for me is that, you know, the products that I can show you, uh, especially the stuff that's coming out between now and say March or, or April or so, there's a lot I can point to to say, this was my idea and this was my idea and, and they let me have my way on this. And so there's a lot of, of Mike in the Swamp Box scopes where I can say, I spent months going, what if we did it this way instead of doing it that way? Um, and that's super cool for me. That's like a dream job for me to be in that position. But it also means I need to know what the hell I'm talking about and make the right decisions. Because if I build scopes that I think are cool that Mike wants, but nobody else wants them because I'm a weirdo and I like oddball stuff, then we'll be out of business if they listen to me. We're going to build weird stuff that nobody wants to buy. Yeah. So I have to pay attention to what the American shooter wants and what they're willing to pay for. I need to have my thumb on the pulse of that or else we'll be in bad trouble real quick because these guys aren't listening to me. That's, that's a good way to put it. <laughs> well, and, and another thing that I would say about that too is, you know, there's a, there's a conventional wisdom that's out there that all of this stuff is shell games and it's all the same and it's all made in China by a bunch of dirty little commies who hate Americans, but they build cheap crap for us that always breaks and it doesn't work. And this is just the same crap you could have gotten two years ago and it had somebody else's name on it. And, you know, if there's one thing that I want people to understand is that that's not true. Um, that's not true in general in the industry, although there's some of that, but it's definitely not true for us. We're definitely engineering our own stuff. We're developing our own stuff. We're testing our own stuff. And we go through a whole process that takes a long time before we bring anything to market, before anything actually becomes public and we flip the switch on the website and it's ready to sell. There's a whole process involved and it's not just, you know, well, this is a Burris, you know, or a Vortex or whatever from two years ago. And, we called the factory and they'd say, you know, we'll, they'll put our name on the side for, for a, you know, a, a 500 round, uh, 500 scope batch, you know, they'll, they'll put Swamp Fox on it instead of someone else's name. That's not what we're doing. That's awesome. Now, one question I do have to ask you since you worked at Primary Arms and you mentioned Vortex. <laughs> so I've always heard this rumor that Primary Arms makes Vortex or Vortex makes Primary Arms scopes. It's, it's way more complicated than that. Um, that's true in some cases that I could talk about, but not in every case that I could talk about. Um, so basically, look, think of it this way. So we tend to think of China as like one big factory and like when the ISS space station flies over, they can see it from space because it's so huge, you know? And that's not, that's not how it is. Think about like a rivalry like Ford, Chevy, and Dodge, except there's about 20 of them. And they're always uh, trying to pinch each other's best workers, and they're trying to spy on each other and get each other's best engineers and get each other's best designs. And they're trying to do all of that stuff and try to get a leg up. But it's not just like Ford versus Chevy versus Dodge. It's like 20 different places where you could go and get your product built if you want. And... Um, and so, you know, there is some sharing of factories and sharing of models sometimes that happens between different brands. And you can tell uh, eventually the truth comes out, you know, and, and people kind of figure it out. Um, but it's, it's really complicated, you know. I've just always heard that. And I was like, you know, I'm sure that's out there. I'm sure that's not the only thing out there that's one company makes this and then it's branded. And, but like, that's the big argument. I see it at work with guys at work. They argue back and forth. Well, Vortex is good. Oh, well, Primary Arms is good. And it's like, you know what? Shut the hell up and just shoot it. Yeah, at a certain at a certain point, the, the, the product needs to speak for itself. Whatever brand name is on the side, it doesn't know. The, the product doesn't know what name is on the side. All the product knows is whether it's in spec or not. And the brand loyalty can get kind of silly sometimes. There's a lot of, you know, hey, I know that 
my Oldsmobile is better than your Pontiac and everybody knows that Buick sucks. Ha 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 ha. Well, yeah, you know, Buick Oldsmobile and Pontiac are related as it turns out. Right. I mean, that's the way that it was for many years and they competed against each other. So, so there's a little bit of that going on. So with being in the optics market, I mean, you know, optics markets, kind of in my opinion it's 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 a big market like you've got you got my cv life 40 dollar that i had on my 22 yeah for six to 24 by 50 all the way up to yeah you've got you know your night force and your avns and you know a couple thousand dollar optics that people were putting on hog rifles and stuff uh my niece's boyfriend just picked up one of the uh Eight, what did I say? ATMs or AT? Uh, his night vision thermal optic. I don't know. He's like, yeah, we're gonna have to test it. I was like, dude, we got coyotes. Let's go. Let, let's go. Like, just bring it up. Put it on a QD mount. We'll throw it on my AR and we'll go. <laughs> I'll oh. bring the cam. <laughs> I forgot. You're friends with him. He just he just messaged him. <laughs> but um, you know, it's it's a big market. And with that being said, do you see, like, where do you see Swamp Fox at in that industry for optics? That's a good question. So a lot of people go, man, it must be tough to be in the optics business because it's so crowded. You know, there's so much in there. There's so many brand names and there's so many products and, you know, it must be really hard. And, and I usually say, well, it is crowded, but it's crowded with a lot of junk. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff, like I said, where it's all shared, um, and it's just the same product over and over again. Oh my God, it's night vision, man. Night vision, man has joined us. He's an operator. Moving your out. He's an operator. Um, so that's wrong thing. Is that better? Oh, <laughs> uh, either way, but just stop moving it because we can hear the audio on the recording. <laughs> Oh, John, I'm going to kill you. Is it good? Yes, good. Yes, Don't touch good. it. You Leave it be. <laughs> Anyways, sorry about that. So anyway, um, I think there's always there's always a place for a product that's good or is, or is the best value. There's always going to be a place for that. There's lots of products out there that are claiming to be high value, that are claiming to be the best of this or the best of that. Um, but there's only one that can really be the best at anything. Um, you know, so all these different brands have one or two things that stand out as being the best. Uh, Vortex has, for example, the Razer HD series, which is a fantastic scope. They're a little expensive, but they're really nice. Uh, they just came out with a one to 10. It looked amazing at SHOT Show. What a fantastic scope it is. Um, you know, if you wanted to say what's the best one to 10 out there, in a low power variable, right now it might be that Gen 3 Vortex. Now it's MSRP $2,900 for that sucker. Yeah. It better be nice. Um, you know, you get one on Black Friday sale and you might snag one for $2,300 or $2,500, you know. Um, so then we have the question of what's the best for the money? What's the best if I only have $1,000 to spend? What's the best if I only have $600 to spend? So where Vortex or where, where Swamp Fox comes in, I think, is we're going to be the best scope you can buy for its price point at any price point. Um, that's my goal is whatever you think the price point is for the best value on the market right now, when we come out with our new version of whatever that is, we're going to beat what you think is the best deal on the internet right now. That's our goal. Awesome. Cool. So, and that's, that's an easy thing to say. It's an easy thing to get on a podcast and be like, yeah, we're badass. Woo. But like to actually do it, do it. And make it happen is a ton of work. Yeah. It is not, that's a big claim that I just made and we're working I've been, on. I've been searching you guys' uh, website before this interview and checking out the prices and everything. And yeah, I mean, you guys are doing damn good on the price marks especially for what you guys are offering and especially with the lpvos and your guys is uh what is that the king slayer yeah and um you guys 
definitely are, I think, going to make some big waves in the optics game, especially with the price offerings that you guys have. I hope so. Uh, you know, it, it all depends on the quality of the product, too. Uh, you know, if I tell people there's nothing I can say. There's no YouTube celebrity that I can hire and pay money to who's going to save us if the products break. Like either the products live and they continue to work and they go down the road and they do what we said they would do, in which case we're all going to be successful and the company's going to grow. If all the products break six months from now and everything just falls apart and, and they suck, like we're out of business. There's nothing I can say to fix that. The products have to speak for themselves. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of, a lot of the stuff in this industry. You know, I've always, I've shot and everything since I was younger and never really got deep into the industry until the last two years. And, you know, I think that's, that's a lot of the industry is where you have a product and everybody's like, okay, yeah. And they put all their time, effort, money into advertising the product, but their R and D sucks. And, you know, a month or two later, the product is broke or the company's out of business. And so. Yeah. And this, this industry is absolutely littered with examples of what not to do in all kinds of various ways. You know, people will email me and go, why don't you do this? Why don't you do that? I wish you would do a dual focal plane, you know, blah, 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 crazy. They have crazy ideas on, you could have multiple emitters and each one would have its own zero. And, and I'm like, you can't, you know, everybody likes to innovate. We all want an innovative product, but for example, look at Hudson, the Hudson H9 pistol. It was so innovative. And it did so many things different and new that hadn't been done before. And there was all this hype, you know, oh man, it, you know, the recoil is going to be amazing on this because it has this and this and this and this and this. And now they're out of business. You know, they, yeah. they, they couldn't even, they couldn't even repair the ones that broke, you know. Uh, That's what we were talking at work the other day. Uh, one of my coworkers brought up that new alien pistol. Hmm. I... <laughs> Personally, if I'm going to spend $5,000, it's not going to be on a 9 mil. It's going to be on something probably in the 45 ACP range from like Nighthawk Tactical or Cabot or something like that. Well, there's always, there's always a, an opportunity cost. And, uh, you, you know, for some of us, there's a life outside of firearms too. Like I know a guy who has... There are, there are guys out there and they just, it's their priority. Like I know a guy who's an Instagram Glock guy and he's got like 20 Instagram Glocks and they've all got titanium nitride barrels and holes cutting the slides and they're the coolest. And the guy doesn't own a bed frame and he doesn't have carpet in his house, you know, cause he spends it all on Glocks, you know? Yeah. That would be me if I didn't have a wife. <laughs> Glock special. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not just Glocks, just firearms in general. If I didn't have a wife, I'd probably... <laughs> I would have guns galore. Man, just cracked. <laughs> but see, isn't it good that we have good women in our lives that can kind of save us from ourselves a little bit? Just just a little bit? Yes. Be yeah. like, oh, you know... <laughs> yeah, you probably should pay the electric bill instead of going and buying that $3,000 crate of ammo yeah you're but right <laughs> yes i mean that half will be dented and unusable anyway because they're jammed in a yeah. barrel and shit yeah see better. my wife's smart if you've seen that post floating around facebook where they had the drum of ammo at rural king for four grand yeah my wife goes no 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 i would put you on a monetary value damn it shit <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, she's learned with me. We've been That's married. Me we've been married for almost 13 years. So she's learned very quickly <laughs> what I will do. <laughs> it's like so, she knows you after 13 years. It's like she knows you. Yeah. So let's get into some of the uh, models that you guys have. Um, so you guys have the what? You have the tomahawk, and then it's one here. 
um, and the Arrowhead and your LPVOs. Um, let's talk a little bit about them because I'm, I'm I'm a big fan of the LPVOs. And I'm in the market for one. And so. he's in the market. Uh, Ah, okay. Here I go into sales guy mode. Welcome. Come on in. <laughs> Come on in. I like this. Well, I'm in. I've been looking. Okay, so I'm an LPVO guy myself, right? Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you the spiel on, on Tomahawk and Arrowhead. So Swamp Fox had Tomahawk out before I was hired. Um, is a really good LPVO for the money and still is a really good LPVO for the money. And so I'll just like say it out loud in front of everybody. The Tomahawk as it is right now is much better than say the strike Eagle class of, of LPVOs. So by itself, the Tomahawk will beat a strike Eagle. Man, what where were you guys like three months ago? Yeah. We were there, man. You hadn't heard I was of there. Yet. I just didn't know about you enough. So it's okay because what happens is then you get one and then you compare it to the Strike Eagle side by side and then you see if I'm right or if I'm full of shit. That's what, that's how this is going to go. Yep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. As I look at you. Yeah. <laughs> then I'm just. Yeah, now, now I've got him drinking. By your oh. So with the LPVOs. I noticed you have um, a one. They have a one to four power, which is kind of low for an LPVO. I guess that I've seen a lot of them are one to six, one to eight. Um, you guys have a one to ten, and then of course you know after that you're getting into different ranges of scopes. But the one to four, like what with the one to four, what? Uh, what would you recommend, like, putting that on? Would you still put it on an AR platform, or would it be more of a 22 thing, or? There, you know what's funny? Um, you know, <laughs> so uh, the vast majority of one to fours right now are going into law enforcement, and the, the, the it's funny because the cops will say, well, it has to be a one to four because our department policy is that anything higher than four power is a sniper scope because they're kind of far behind on, on what's really going on. And they have their department standards were written 10 years ago and they've never been brought up to, you know, this is 2020 now. And, you know, the guys who uh, wrote the standards on what's going to go on what rifle, you know, they wrote it back in, you know, a pre 9-11 world or, or even older than that. Sometimes they've had their, their policies been in place since the 1980s. So, Anything more than a four power at maximum magnification is saw uh, that's SWAT team only. You got to be on the SWAT team to have one of those. Well, okay, so you know you can you can put a one to four on your patrol rifle because that's all the chief will allow you to do. But most civilians who get whatever they want and can buy anything they want, most of them are going with higher magnification now. When we stepped up from the Tomahawk to the Arrowhead, we didn't do a one to four at all in the Arrowhead series, and those are the ones that we're trying to sell to law enforcement. They've got all they check all the boxes for law enforcement and we didn't we didn't even bother to do a one to four with those one to six one to eight and one to ten and those are basically see because like a lot of the when i was thinking when i seen that i'm like one to four i'm like so basically you're taking when i was looking at it so i was like basically you're taking a regular red dot holographic scope like an eotech and putting a magnifier behind it i was like didn't really see kind of a purpose, but I under, now I see with, with like law enforcement like that, I could understand that. You have to keep in mind, Zach, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of Leos that like legit hydro shocks are still the stand, like the carry ammo because they haven't moved on from, uh, actually I was listening to, I don't know if it was the, we like shooting podcast or if it was primary and secondary, but I heard some guy talking about, his local sheriff's department up until he got into the department, they were still using uh, revolvers. And it happens. And, that, and that's exactly what these folks were dealing with. That type of stuff. That's why they have a one to four. Yeah. yeah. Stuff's still outdated a little bit. Yeah. I think in, in low power variables, the sweet spot for me is one to six and one to eight 
mm -hmm. love my one to 10. The one to 10 is also super cool just because it goes up to the biggest number and you get the most zoom. But I think the sweet spot, the Goldilocks of if you could just have one and it's sort of a do it all scope, which is what they're really for. Uh, the one to six and the one to eight is, is where it's at. And, and yeah, when, when we're selling them the law enforcement, you know, we were at SWAT roundup in Orlando, which was amazing. We got a sponsored SWAT team. Uh, we started out, we hooked into them so they would do product testing for us. Like, Hey, take these arrowhead prototypes and go do SWAT stuff with them. And if they break, we promise not to get mad. Um, you know, we'll find the failure the point. Start out of them and let us know yeah. how you like them. Right. Like beat the snot out of the prototypes so we know what breaks first and we can go, oh, we better fix that before we make the production ones. Well, they didn't break them. They fell in love with them and they said, we gotta, we're going to compete with these in the, in the world you know, championship. And we're like, oh, crap. Well, I guess we better get a, a, a booth you know, and show up. So we go, to the, we go to the SWAT roundup and we're talking to these guys about low power variables. You know, some of the best shooters in the world, these cops are legit guys. And we're saying, you know, this is like a red dot. This is like a red dot plus a magnifier, plus your hunting three to nine scope, all in one scope body. Think about how versatile that is. It's pretty hard to beat, really. Yeah. So yeah, tell tell us more about the uh, the tomahawk and the arrowhead. Like, what are the some of the specs and stuff on them? So, so I'm trying to think about where to start out with this. So one interesting thing that your your audience might be interested in is a lot of people will uh they look through a scope and they say oh this scope's got really good glass this scope's got good glass and or, or this scope doesn't have very good glass and i have a theory actually that um most of us don't really judge glass very well what we judge is user experience a scope that's easy to use and easy to look through we think has really good glass and a scope that's hard to look through we think has crappy glass so one of the interesting things about Tomahawk and Arrowhead is the glass quality is actually identical. They're made of the same glass in the, in the same place by the same guys. It's the good, it's the best glass we can make. We don't know how to make it any better than, than we are. But when you look through an Arrowhead, you think that the glass is better than the glass that's in a Tomahawk because it's uh, the optical engineering, the science of the shape of the lenses and how they're related to each other is so much newer and better in the arrowhead that you think the glass is actually better. Do you guys get that a lot? Like, oh, well, wow, this glass is way clearer than this one. Yeah, uh, and to me, it's to me, it's uh, I'm an eyebox snob. Do you guys are you familiar with the phrase eyebox? The term eyebox? Yeah, I'm an. At least I know guy. what it is. Yeah. So uh, let me grab something. Aha! Here we go. Speaking of, yeah. So here I've got my my arrowhead. Uh, let's see what can I show you on this. So we've got lockable turrets. I can't Ooh. turn them. I have to pop up like that. Now I can turn it. If I push it back down, I can't turn it again. Right? Just stuff like that. That's handy wow. for law enforcement. I like that. I like that. Right. <laughs> so that's I boxes like get my angle here. So iBox is me looking through the scope and it's, there's what's called an exit pupil that comes out of the scope and it's the diameter of the shaft of light that comes out the back of the scope. And my, my eye needs to line up with that shaft of light in order to look through the scope. If it's a small exit pupil and a small iBox, then the scope is hard to use. And even if it has really good glass, technically in terms of how the glass is made or what country it comes from, oh, this is German glass, or this is Japanese glass. That's all very good, but if I can't look through the damn thing quickly, if I can't get an instant sight picture as soon as I need it, because holy crap, there's a coyote right there. Yeah. I need to shoot him right now, and he's only 40 yards away. I need to bring it up and shoot fast. If I can't do that, then the scope's useless to me. So, so when you're talking eyebox, you're more talking X, Y access to available like head motion, basically behind the glass. It'd be almost the. Uh, the X, Y, top to bottom, left to right of uh, eye relief, in a sense. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. It's literally, you know, it's like a, a ring or a box, and somewhere inside this ring, my eye has to go in there in order to see through the scope. And the more flexible that is, the faster the scope is. 
And what happens is, is that the nice thing about low power variables is going all the way down to one X, they can be very, very fast and forgiving, almost as fast and forgiving as a red dot, but not quite. Oop, you said something. Go on. Ignore that. I, I was literally just like agreeing. I, I so an LPVO will never be quite as fast as a red dot, but it can be damn close. Um, but then as you crank magnification up, as magnification increases, the eye box goes down, it gets smaller, and the scope gets harder to see through. That's one of the big challenges of a one to 10 is can you make a one to 10 that's fast at one, but also still usable at 10 and isn't like super picky to look through at, at 10 power. Um, and that's also why when you see precision rifles, you know, when you've got a big 30 power, you know, precision scope, all of those uh, precision rifles have those um, crazy looking stocks that are adjustable six ways from Sunday. Right. Mm -hmm. Think about like uh the Magpul chassis for Remington 700s that just came out and there's like a dozen ways to screw with that stock. And the whole point is to get your head behind it the same way every time because you have the stock perfectly adjusted so that your head goes in the same place so that your eye looks through that tiny eye box on your giant 30 power scope that you bought. Um, yeah, you that's the challenge. Those scopes you can see in the next year with. Yeah. <laughs> um because like I, that's and that's a good thing because when i was looking <clears throat> originally for my rifle i was just going to throw a red dot on it <clears throat> and um a lot of guys says well just get an lpvo that way you can you know leave it down at one power it's accessible like a red dot and then you can just crank it up when you need to get out yeah. for yardage instead of having to flip over a magnifier and um, that was the one thing that really interested me was being able to flip from, you know, the powers. And the one thing I like about your guys' optic is you have the flip lever. Yes. That, yeah, we, that thing is awesome. One of the things that I'm most proud of about us is that we include a lot of that stuff from the factory in the box already. And we don't make you pay extra for it as an, as an accessory. You get, you know, the flip caps that come with this are nice flip caps. They don't suck. You know, uh, I have a lot of people that go, well, hey, what's the, uh, what's the Butler Creek numbers? Uh, it just kinda, Cause I'm going to upgrade from your flip caps to the Butler Creeks. And I go, do you have your scope yet? And they go, no, I just ordered it earlier today. It hasn't shipped out. I, I haven't seen it yet. I'm like, you might want to wait. wait. Um, yeah. Just, just, you know, it's, it's an O2 up front and it's a 20 in the back. Those are the numbers fine. But, you might not want to order. And then they get the scope and they're like, holy crap, your factory flip caps don't suck. That never happens. Yeah. <laughs> um, on the throw levers, I'll, I got to brag a little bit. So this, this uh, I was part of the design process on the throw lever for Arrowhead. It was a collaboration. There's more than one of us that had input on it. But um, y y when we're talking about quality and we're talking about performance, Sometimes you can do things to increase performance or increase quality without costing yourself any more money. Do it smarter instead of more expensive, right? So here's an example where we got we did something better than the than the tomahawk on the arrowhead. So woo, there it is. So here's my throw lever, and it's attached with four little tiny screws instead of a ring, because the ring can slip if you drop it or uh, or if it just loosens up over time. Usually there's just one screw it can slip, right? So with four little screws, this is attached directly to the magnification ring, but look how thin it is. It's super wow. skinny, right? And the reason is now if I, if I drop this thing, this little guy is going to just shear right off and the rest of the scope is going to be okay. It's just going to break right off. And then I send you another, another throw ring, throw lever that costs us probably like $3 to make or whatever. I'm not going to make you spend $40 on an aftermarket one. I'll send it to you in the mail and well, say, oh, you know, no problem, no big deal. But I didn't have to RMA a whole freaking $400 or $500 scope because, you know, we wrecked something that really matters. This little thing is a sacrificial part. Did it cost us any more to do it that way? No. It's just smarter. Yeah. The engineer felt like a crumple zone or something. Yeah, I like the fact that like how that is it just shears off and then you're not you're not 
busting the scope. You're not busting the throat, like the adjustment ring. You're just replacing a tiny little piece of metal like that instead of, like you said, a whole $500 scope. Right. And we, and we include it in the box. We're not going to make you like, you know, look in the aftermarket and see if there's one that fits and then you order it and you pay $30 plus shipping. And then you wonder if it's going to fit or not. Like just throw it in the box already, guys. Come on. How yeah. hard is that? It's not hard at all. Um, so now are your guys, are your reticles, are they illuminated? <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> he likes that. He's like, Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, oh, yeah. Definitely. Um, um, the difference yeah. between, again, with, uh, with Arrowhead and the Tomahawk, Arrowhead, I think, is a little bit brighter, but it also, again, for the law enforcement guys and also for the hunting guys, um, we've got two night vision compatible settings on there. So you can put like a, a PBS-14 behind it, and if you're on N1 or N2, they're impossible really to see with the naked eye. Very, very difficult to see with the naked eye but the, the night vision optic will pick them up and then you can go hog hunting at night and stuff with these. Super fun. Uh, there's a lot of that down here in Texas. I'm in Houston and there's a lot of hog hunting down here. We have to kill like 2 million hogs a year just to keep pace at all right I, now. It's terrible. I'm trying to get, uh, my dad has a friend um, that is down there and trying to get things worked out to where we can possibly go hog hunting later this year in texas and um the guy's like don't worry about guns don't just come down he says i've got guns says, i've got night vision he says hell if i have to <clears throat> he's friends with the guy that hunts him out of the helicopter he says yeah. we'll go shoot the things out of the helicopter i was like down yeah. i was like all you had to say is i'm shooting shit out of a helicopter i'm game yeah but I'm America's a that, you know all the guys in like the UK and uh, you know the European Union are like, wait, they 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 have helicopters and they shoot guns out of the helicopters at animals for fun, and that's not a military thing. We're like, America. That's America, the capital M. That well, that's America, and then in tiny parentheses, which really, Texas. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because everybody thinks America is Texas. America with a capital M is Texas. Let's be honest, I guess. Okay. It, well, I absolutely love Texas. I mean, I've been there twice and I absolutely love it. I've been trying to convince my wife to let us move there, but yeah. I don't know, it's good to find out. Um So we've got the LPVOs a little bit. Um and you know, I've seen I, like I said uh, for our listeners, you guys got to go to the website, check all the specs out. Um, let's get into a little bit of like the, let's talk about like the Kentucky Long and the Patriot series of scopes. Now we're talking more of your precision slash hunting rifle scopes, correct? Right. Um, so actually, you know, what's really interesting to me and, and I didn't really anticipate this happening, but I'm glad it, it has, uh, the Patriot series is actually taking off with the, uh, the 22 rimfire matches. There's a, there's a league called NRL 22 and it's basically precision 22, uh, shooting. And they have an open division where you can spend like untold amounts of stupid money if you want to. But then there's a, a, a division where you need to spend less than I think it's less than $1,300 on your entire setup. And that's MSRP for the rifle, for the mount, for the scope, for your bipod, for everything. There's a, basically a, a cap on what you can spend. And what the 22 guys are finding out is that the Patriot in four to 16 and six to 24 is one of the highest performing scopes for the money. Like I was telling you, that's our goal. Uh, we're selling a lot of these to these guys because they perform way higher than what you spend, and it lets them buy a better rifle. It lets them lets them buy a better bipod. They can spend that money elsewhere and not blow past the cap on how much you can spend on this uh, 22 competition. So we're actually selling a ton of them. You know, they'll they'll stand up to 300 win mag. It's not like a dedicated rimfire scope, but the NRL 22 guys are loving it. Nice. That's kind of cool that like they they've found that they can use those in that series and that's the one thing that 
getting into um, being that you talked to Ash, we're, I'll be shooting. We, we sh both should be shooting. I don't know. We're still up in the air with him yet. Um, do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. I don't even know what it is, but do it. Yeah. He broke his hand. So to shoot uh, Ash's competition in September, the, the uh, quantified performance uh, precision match in September, and, um, you know, seeing so what they have in their limits, they don't have, like, a price limit. But I've heard that with, like, some of the PRS guys. Like, oh, there's a, there's a limit of price. As my kid hands me a Nerf gun. Oh, cool. I, I think we need a Swamp Fox red dot on that. Yeah, well, that, do I see some Picatinny on there on the front? Uh, yeah. We make that happen. There yeah. we go. <laughs> <laughs> That's what's on my dad's office. Um, but we had, uh, you know, I see price limits, and it's like, okay, so you want to keep a price limit, but how am I supposed to buy this and this and this and do a bipod and this scope and this and keep it within this price limit? It's like, you guys don't realize what – like, it's almost like they're like, okay, yeah, we want you to buy the cheapest shit and do the best that you can. Yeah, it's a difficult balance for sure. But, I mean, I'm really proud of it because those guys are obviously guys who are, like I said, guys that are looking for maximum value. They can't afford to waste a single dollar. And so if they're choosing our scopes to do this because they've decided that our stuff is the best value on the market, then I'm proud as hell to be part of that. Absolutely proud as, as as can be that patriots having success in in that discipline and those guys take it serious like these guys it's not just plinking with grandpa's you know old 22 or you know taking a 200 dollar ruger 1022 out and throwing it at, at cans and stuff these guys are really serious about it oh yeah i've seen some of the precision 22s they're unreal the money they have wrapped up in these guns and um, I've seen two of the, why are we shooting Nerf guns at each other? Uh, <laughs> I've got my wife carrying around a T-Rex Nerf pistol. It's literally, a, it's a T-Rex. <laughs> my dad, this is my dad. <laughs> that, that's a and it, gun. like you pull it's its tail back and crank its leg. It's, it's, it's a Nerf. That is fantastic. Her, her and my son are shooting at each other. Ow! <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, can I please do my interview? Please. Whatever for my son. Um, you know, we had um, where I work at, where me and John work at, we work near, um, we work in Pittsburgh, so we have WVU uh, students fly through, and I actually got to meet the a uh, girl that got the gold medal at the last sum last summer Olympics for shooting. Oh wow. And you know, sitting and talking to her for a couple seconds, you know, she started out using a twenty two and she showed me a couple of pictures of her rifles that she uses outside of the Olympics and it's just like I don't even want to know how much money you have wrapped up in just the chassis for that rifle, let alone the barrel. That was the first thing I thought of when you met. We guys were talking about like the, the high end twenty twos was the uh, was like the Olympics. He's like, isn't that like the like the big thing for like the, the triathlon and all that shit? Are they running twenty two LR? I believe so. I could be wrong. I mean, I've only ever experienced the any Olympic event from via television, but like from what I can tell, anyway, it always seemed like twenty two LR. Yeah, it could be. <laughs> So, um, so you guys have like your typical like long distance hunting scopes and everything. Um, we'll get there. We'll get there. I, he, he keeps showing my co-host keeps showing me pictures of the Kingslayer. <laughs> Let's get into the Liberator. Let's talk about the Liberator a little bit because that's your basic red dot for you know either a PCC or your AR. I would probably put it on a PCC, but that's just me. Yeah, so uh, Liberator can lead into the Kingslayer pretty easily, honestly. Um, so that was our first product. And uh, it comes in 
three flavors. You can get a three MOA red dot. You can get a, a red circle dot or a green circle dot. And uh, it's, it's just a standard, uh, very no nonsense tube type micro dot. Uh, the, the body is T1 compatible. Like any, if you're not T1 compatible, then you don't, you don't know what you're doing. So any of your Aimpoint T1 mounts, your QD mounts, whatever mount that you like for Aimpoint T1 will fit it just fine. There's a ton of aftermarket stuff that's uh, high and low as far as mounts go. You can, you can get cheapy mounts from UTG that are 30 bucks and they're actually pretty darn good. They actually are way better than they used to be. Now he's Blue Man. It's the Blue Man group. <laughs> um, John, I swear, when, when I see you at work on Wednesday, we're going to have words. <laughs> I swear. <laughs> I was on the phone. <laughs> I mean, we know it's people. It's not good. He works with me. Oh, God, both. Go ahead, say it, say it. Yep, yep. <laughs> gave it's TSA. Say it. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we both work for TSA. I don't care. <laughs> Is that bad? You guys, why? I was trying to like the light in the room for myself. Shut up. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> get back to, just shush. I'm going to beat all of you. First, if so, he's not showing a picture of an AIT and a hashtag, that is, does not apply, that, that phrase. God. You guys can't keep any interview serious. I'm trying. I, he said he doesn't want to be hard on us. I don't even know which, which way I actually pointed him on camera. Yeah, you. <laughs> what did I do? I don't know. I'm just no, no, pointing. Keep so, anyway, so, the one thing this year that I've learned when it – when it comes to scopes is God mounts are expensive. Yes. Um, they don't have to be, but that's the tradition. We're working on that too. So like with Liberator, you got two mounts right in the box. You get a low mount that's uh, good for shotguns and such. And then you get a high amount that's good for ARs. So again, with the whole, just trying to add as much value as we can for the customer. Um, put them both on the box. Don't charge anybody extra for it. Don't make them go and look in the aftermarket. If you have a favorite aftermarket mount, it'll work just fine. Um, but you don't have to because we, we included it in the box. So, uh, but yeah, good mounts can be, can be crazy. Actually, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of, and it's probably boring as hell to other people, but the rings on, on this scope here, these are our hostile engagement rings is what we call them. The engagement ring that men really want. Uh, um, I like that. That's yeah, a yeah. that's a good sales pitch. I like yeah, that. I, that's that one we couldn't really put on the website, you know. <laughs> that was, but uh, that was you know the inside the joke. Marketing. So, so these are really legit rings, right? The so, ring uh, these have an RMR footprint cut into the side of them, so you don't have to buy uh, an adapter separately or forty-five degree offset mount. You can take any Trigicon RMR footprint scope whoa that's pretty crazy to do and you can put it on here oh no shit yeah so i can i can get a backup uh i can put a king slayer on here or you know the oh, wow. scopes, liberty and justice but these rings these are made out of 7075 and they're truly hard code anodized and they're generally under 100 bucks at msrp uh, if you get one on sale or you get one from a place like optics planet they're way under 100 bucks and they're really, really freaking legit uh, rings. And and what I put on the website is, you know, your AR-15 lower, your AR-15 upper, and these rings are all made of the same material and they've got the same finish on them. And it's under a hundred bucks. What's not to like? like wow. Yeah. I like that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a mine, wisdom thing. A friend of mine uh, showed me uh, the Badger Ordnance. Um, and of course, that's we're talking top of the line, and I'm like, there is no way in hell I'm dropping three hundred and some dollars on a scope mount. And he goes, shoot one one time, and you will. And I was like, no, yeah, I still won't do it. Actually, actually, Zach, one of our coworkers, um, JY, we'll just say, just to leave it extra. Big. Oh yeah, he just but, bought one. You know, yeah. Yeah, well, he was. I, I actually pointed out to him, like, for, for 
for a uh, segue to our guest there, primary arms optic, it was a good deal. And then he, like, I literally told him, he was asking me, like, scope rings, and I was like, like, like yeah, I, I told him Midwest, just not, you know, just as far as, like, the stuff that I've been kind of pre-programmed with over the years. And now seeing all, all the stuff that these, that these folks offer, I'm like, well, holy crap. Like, on the other hand, he uh, he's in love still, you know, with, with that end of it. Um, but yeah, like rings can be such a like it's like it's it's like a hot topic. Like is it JY will say like he was like, oh no, but we, we, I'm gonna get these scopes and I'm gonna get a ring cutter and we're gonna I'm gonna rebore them and all this and I'm like holy crap, that's a lot of work. Why don't you just buy rings and work off the bat? <laughs> yeah. Um, speaking of that, uh, my one friend that was here, um, he said to mention to you guys, he's probably going to be placing an order for a liberator uh, for his Aero Nine. Yay! That's he, perfect he, for that. He, he literally went and looked at it. He's like, what's the name of this company? And I told him, and he's like, yeah, probably going to be buying a Liberator for the Air 9 But um, so you have, let's get into the final thing, which is the Kingslayer, which I am wanting this year to get into Pistol Red Dots. Okay. And never touched a pistol with a red dot on it. And at that price, I probably will be. Um, never mess with it. So explain a little bit about the Kingslayer, because, you know, everybody knows they have the RMR and the Hollow Sun 507C, and I don't know, uh, the Venom from Vortex. Um, I like how your guys' look. Yeah, thanks. To be honest. Uh, okay, so this is this is a long spiel um because That's there, fine, there's, man. there's so much i could there's so much i could say like i'm gonna get on my soapbox here so um i'll, I'll drop some news on the podcast like let's let's drop some new news right go for it so <clears throat> so uh kingslayer was our gen one rmr cut um dot side in it. it the msrp was 220 bucks right that's what you see on the website that means your map pricing at places like uh, Optics Planet is like in the 180s, you know, it's under 200 bucks, you know, mm. if, if you get a deal on one, right? And the, the nice thing about Kingslayer is, is that it lives. It doesn't just die because the conventional wisdom is you got to spend 600 bucks on the real thing um, or, or, you know, you have to spend 300 bucks on uh, or 350 bucks on a, on a, on a holoxon. The Hollow Sun 507 is a fantastic, fantastic scope for the money. It's that also that value leader, right? You can get those at Optics Planet for 300, 350 bucks all day long, and, and they, they don't die. They live, right? So, so we're undercutting them on price. We have, we have a cheaper scope, and it lives on, on various applications that traditionally a scope in that price point would die. And you'd have to send it back and go, well, you know, it lived for a while. Um, but eventually it died. So example, hey, here's another one I can grab for you. So my personal um, favorite Kingslayer, which is not a, uh, it's not a Game of Thrones joke, by the way. All of our stuff is uh, Revolutionary War themed. So it's all about getting rid of King George and yep. making America its own country. That's the one thing I, names. that is the first thing I noticed with all, I love that, was the names. So, so my personal Kingslayer right now is living on, this is Old Stumpy. Old Stumpy is my, uh, my Remington 870. Oh. Show you that Old Stumpy is unloaded. That's TAC-13, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's a registered short-barreled shotgun. It's got a 14-inch oh. barrel. And Old Stumpy does a lot of testing for me. And so... Uh, my personal Kingslayer on this, what I like about it is, I can actually show you this on, on if I'm lucky. Yeah. Oh, oh, how it's a oh. I like that. It's fantastic. How cool is that for a home defense sight picture? Yeah, that is awesome. So they'll live on a 12 gauge, you know, um, thousands of rounds. Uh, I, I won't drop his name here because I didn't ask him ahead of time, but there's a, a well-known shotgun instructor who I sent him, I got him a good deal on a Kingslayer a while back because he had to send 
his real deal RMR back to Trigicon to get it to get it reworked. You know, it finally went belly up and he said, Hey, I need something just to tide me over until I get this back. And I said, sure, take one of our King Slayers and, you know, let me know how you like it. Well, it's been months now and he still has it on his uh, semi-auto 12 gauge that he teaches with. And he's like, I'm going to keep running this thing till it breaks. He's put, he, he's, he's got his Trigicon back and he put it on something else. Um, but it's, it's, he's that should say something now. right there. Like yeah. for you guys, that well, should be I'm like a, uh, that should be like a crowning moment when somebody well known goes, "Yeah, I'm gonna throw this RMR on something else, and we're gonna run this guy." Yeah, I won't. I won't say who he is. Uh, those who know know who it is, but I, I didn't ask him if I could drop his name on the podcast. But yeah, that's, I that's may know who you're talking about. <laughs> so Kingslayer, like I said, Kingslayer was MSRP in, in at, general, at 220. For, for any testing. Say again. No. Uh, well, I was gonna say, all of I was saying was that uh, in general, like what, in moments like that, that's the best thing, like a compliment or test you could ever have. Really, if nothing else is like, hey, I'm gonna figure out when this breaks because that's I mean, that, like just like how you were talking earlier. That's how you get better. Like, hey, if you can break this, break this for me. That, that that's the, that's probably the best R and D you can get when it comes to like optics and a lot of firearms parts in general, especially for anything that people are gonna consider life saving. Yeah, we definitely, we definitely want to put these scopes in the hands of people who really have like legitimate round counts. Um, I know he won't mind me saying his name. So Rich, the guy who uh, is is sort of the captain of our sponsored SWAT team, Team Missouri Tactical. We were at that SWAT round up in Orlando, and I'm like, hey, you know, your uh, your Kingslayer looks pretty beat up, bro. You know, he's got a really scratched up one in his holster, and he's like. Yeah, I put 6,000 rounds through it on a long weekend getting ready for this competition. And I'm like, wait, what? 6K <laughs> rounds. Well, uh, in, yeah, in preparation for a competition, he took like a long weekend, you know, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, put 6,000 rounds through it just to, you know, make sure I'm warmed up. Those are the guys who have legit. Damn. Yeah. Yeah. So if, if we can make those guys happy, then then we're doing something good. Everything else can trickle down from there. So you want to see what's coming next that's going to be releasing in March, we hope? As yes, I'm sitting please. here rubbing my hands together, yes. So I try to do as much as I can. I, can. I, I don't shoot 6,000 rounds a weekend, but I do shoot every week. So uh, this is one of my test bed guns. It's also my competition gun. So this is my uh, SIG 320X5. And on the back of this is, this is called Liberty. And you can see this one's in flat dark earth. Damn, I like that already. This is, this is also an RMR cut. It's narrower than the Kingslayer on both sides. This will fit in any of the law enforcement Safari Land holsters. This is the one that we have designed for everyday carry and law enforcement. It's got three times the battery life. If you swap out the battery once a year, you're gonna be good with this. It's got shake awake that's sent to, to four minutes. So I put this thing down. Four minutes later, it falls asleep and it shuts off the battery and it draws no power at all. As soon as I pick it up again, it flips back on to the previous brightness setting. And I'll show you something cool. Now, I'm not going to point at myself. It might look like I'm pointing at myself. But so what's your biggest worry on a concealed carry uh, optic that's going to just crap out at you? uh unexpectedly one day you're going to have it in your holster and the battery is going to die and the dot's going to die and you're not going to know right that's like yep. the worst nightmare no, right? have to fight. all right so uh, hope, hopefully i can show this so this particular battery is about to die and i'm not going to aim the gun at myself all right so i'm going to activate my dot there we go yep now watch this. See what it's doing? It flashes. Yeah, it flashes. Come on, line up. Boy, this is hard to do. I've never done this before. <laughs> See if I can get it to do it one more time. It does it every 10 seconds or when I push a button. Whoa, so hard to so hard to do. I'm like, everything's backwards. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Basically yeah. flashes. Yeah, it flashes every five seconds. 
and it lets you know, whoo, it was so hard. Anyway, it will, it'll let you know that your battery is at 5%. Oh, wow. So you have, you have a, basically like a couple of weeks at that point to, that you really need to swap the battery out. So you get a warning. Now, oh, so a couple of weeks are splashing. That's, that's perfect. Yeah. Now, where is the battery? I check mine every day. You know, like I strap on my gun, I look and make sure the dot's on, and, you know, I go out the door, you know. So, just again, like, did it cost us any more money to make that happen? No. It's just doing it smarter, right? Um, these are made out of 7075 instead of 6061, so they're super tough. And we actually have, I don't have one here to show you, but we're going to have a cover for it. It's a stainless steel shield that attaches to the footprint and it goes all the way around it. You can actually see um, uh, Six Hour has something like this with their Romeo One. Yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, now that is one thing that we're gonna sell separately because not everybody wants to pay for that, not everybody's gonna use it. But for the guys that really wanna do the tough guy stuff and they wanna drop test it, they think the scope's kind of a really hard life, they wanna rack it off of barricades and do all the, all the Instagram stuff, you can buy for some extra money which will be really affordable um, a stainless steel cover that goes over this thing and protects it. And so when it gets hit or when it gets dropped, um, all the shock forces are designed to go straight to the footprint. So if you can whack it with a hammer and all you're doing is you're beating the crap out of your slide and the, the optics sort of inside and safe. Um, so yeah, how cool is that? So that's actually a good thing because then you're not destroying the glass, you're not de destroying any of that. Right. My so, one question with the RMRs, and I know it's a big pain in the ass bitch for everybody. Where is the battery compartment located? Ah, right. I, so, I seen that. That's why when you turned it, I was like, oh, I'm asking this. Right. So uh, in the original, okay, so I'll show you something else. Here's proof that we, that we designed and we've developed our own stuff, right? I told you this isn't the same crap you could have got from another brand last year, right? Mm -hmm. Here's my everyday carry gun. This is my little Glock 26. This is the, oh, what I call the alpha <laughs> prototype. This is what I carry every day. So the alpha prototype has a side tray here. See where that says Swamp Fox? Yes. That's a side tray, and I could maybe, maybe I can do it. There we go. I can pull this out, and there's the battery, right? Nice. Right? Here's the problem. We figured out that's a failure point. If you drop it on this side enough times, you can overcome the mechanism and that side tray will pop out and then you failed your drop test. And then you've got guys on the Instagram going, well, it only survived 12 drops, but the hollow sun survived 15 drops. So the hollow, you know, so no. Yeah. So we added, we identified that as a, as a, as a weak point. So here's Liberty battery comes in from the top. That's what uh, I wanted to see. So awesome. I, can, I can just use a coin or something to get in there. And this is all protected and surrounded. It's got really coarse threads in it, and it can be dropped many, many, many times, and the battery will not pop out. But I also don't have to re-zero when it comes time to change. Don't have to take it off the gun to put a new battery in it and then re-zero. That is by far probably one of the best damn selling points that – I have seen everybody bitch about is well now I got to take it off and now I got to re-zero it. it that you guys will make a killing off of that just in that own right all right so let's so let's do some news so you know that Kingslayer is 220 bucks you know I'm setting you up on this question oh Jesus what do you think what do you think Liberty and Justice are going to go for Justice is the big window version what do you think Liberty and Justice are going to go for if we if if Kingslayer's two twenty, what would you give? What would you give? It's like the price is right. Fifty two seventy five. Two fifty. Two fifty. Nice. Yep. Right. You got it right. First up, now the price right on, which I think it's an extra prize. Um, yeah. Plus, you told my wife what I need to spend soon for my next shot and. Hobby yeah, well, just, I know. Now, does it run, does it run on a 2032 or a 1632? $20. Battery one. So, with that, and now, that optic, that will fit the RMR footprint, correct? Right. Right. 
Yeah, anything that anything that an RMR fits that will fit. Yep. I know where I know where my next two hundred and fifty dollars is going to go when so I finish up the other couple builds. Well, the thing is, that's that's MSRP too. I mean, we run sales all the time. We do coupon codes. If you're law enforcement, you get a law enforcement account, and you get a lot. We give those guys a deep discount. Military and law enforcement get a deep discount through us. So you can do better. But the MSRP is going to be two forty nine. MSRP on the the bigger window version, Justice, will be two fifty nine, and you know how I was saying earlier how that hollow sun is such a great deal at 325, 350 bucks, right? Yeah. This basically okay. destroys it in, in the real world. Now you can spend a hundred dollars less than that for an optic that I believe is legitimately, I've been carrying the alpha prototype on my Glock 26 for three months and shooting it every week. And it's fine. It's optimized for everyday carry. And it's in, and, and we intend for these to be sold to law enforcement. And you and we're so far underneath that hollow sun price point, surely some guys are gonna give us a try. Yeah. You know, for a lifetime warranty product for crying out loud. Right. You definitely probably have one, two, three. Yeah. Uh my friend four you at least got four guys interested this evening. I'm gonna have to wait until uh Liberty and Justice. Hello. Hello. Oh. <laughs> Because <laughs> then, well, then I'll actually, order, yeah. Then I'll order an arrowhead and oh shush. Because <laughs> I don't have an LV, LPVO yet. Um, what is your thought now? Since we were talking about, what's that's, your thought since you carry a red dot? Is applied um, to federal property. What did he say? I have no idea. I John, you broke up. He wants to know if we'll give a discount to the Tub Stackers Association. <laughs> oh, Mac. Really, he went there. <laughs> that is one I haven't heard. Bravo, <laughs> bravo, sir! In the twelve years of working at God, that is not what I have heard. But, but hey, you know, at, at least between you and John, I think we know which one of you is the trainee standing around. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that would be John. <laughs> you can say that all you want. No, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I won't even use the expletive I just deleted. Actually, the, the real question I had earlier, which I think you missed, was I was curious on your pistol optics. Do they run on 1632s or 2032s? Um, it's 1632s because uh, the yeah, screws yeah, for the RMR go where the 2032 battery would have to be. Okay. Yeah, no. the, the screw. it's because of the screw placement. We don't have any choice on that. That's kind of what I assumed. I was just curious. And I asked, and I, I felt like on my janky ass cell phone situation right now, that, that question probably got missed. So, no, I got you. No now, are all of your batteries that size, or do they go a size bigger for like your LPVOs and stuff? Uh, the LPVOs are 2032s. Okay. Um, we have prism scopes coming out. I don't really have a good example uh, to show you, but we've got uh, a one X and a three X prism scope coming out that are really cool, and they actually use a CR one twenty three A flashlight battery. Hmm. Oh, nice! I'm about that, which I have probably ten of those laying around, and I don't have anything that takes CR one twenty threes. I don't know why I have them. You know what's what's cool about CR one twenty three A's is that like the Surefire batteries are shock isolated, so. Yeah. I would use Surefire batteries because they're they're meant for firearm use. Um, Aaron Cowan, who's uh, a pretty good, pretty very well respected uh, uh, authority in this field, he actually wrote a white paper a while back. Uh, you can Google it up, but he did a exhaustive study on batteries and figured out that a lot of people's red dot problems are really not red dot problems; they're really battery problems. That the batteries come apart and die and destroy themselves. Um, and you have to swap the battery out. It's not really your optics fault. It's that the batteries that you're using are not rated for recoil. Isn't that cool? So CR-123s wow. are nice that way. So, so what you're saying is the um, Duracell Ultra Silver Platinum yeah. cadmium coated whatever the hell it is is probably not going to hold up to my 12-gauge shotgun recoil. Well, the, no, the, the name brand stuff like a Duracell or an Energizer will. It's when you're getting like a pack of 100 off of Amazon for five bucks, then that's probably not going to do it. Oh, I was yeah. buying Surefire once. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got a really good deal on Surefire ones one time at the shop, and the guy's like, here, and just hands me like 20 of them, and he goes, 
Give me five bucks. Oh, here you go. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, we do sure that every day. That'd be nice. Five bucks usually. So, yeah. They were trying to get rid of them because they couldn't get sell them. And he's like, here, here's like 20 of them for five bucks. Have a nice day. Okay, dude. I only needed four, but thanks. You need them all. You just, yes. You just you just you like I need all the bullets and all the lumens for flashlights. Yeah, it's like ammo and mags. There's no such thing as too much ammo and mags or flashlight batteries. Nope. Or, 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 or lumens batteries. on flashlights or... Especially when you're chasing us. Please look in here. Oh, shut up. <laughs> um, I don't even know how long we've been going, dude. Like, it's been a minute. About an hour. Um, long enough that my wife asked twice. So, um, I don't. I really don't have any more questions. I think we, we need got our them. three normals. Well, we'll get I, I, three normals. Well, Actually, I do have one other question. I did. So, like okay, John. Let me ask my question, then you can ask yours. Um, since you carry a red dot optic, what is like? What is your thought on? EDCing a red dot optic is it a good thing is it something that you really need to consider or is it something that like you really should practice with before you start carrying it yeah that's um a really really important question and i think more people need to have that discussion so when people talk about transitioning to a to a dot for, for whether you're EDC, whether you're a concealed carrier like we are, or whether you're a law enforcement officer and you've got this thing on your duty firearm, right? Um, when, when you're carrying it all day, every day, and it's your primary means of self-defense, I tell people you need to climb dry fire mountain first. Um, dry fire is free. Dry fire does not cost you anything, any more than you've already spent on your setup. All you have to do is take five minutes a day, and it, it sounds like one of those commercials for five-minute abs. Five minutes a day, and you can have six-pack abs. No, I can't because it's under four inches of fat. Um, but you can take five minutes a day, and you can <laughs> you can take four, you know, five minutes a day, and you can do some dry fire because uh, getting your presentation better to where you pick up the dot very quickly is paramount in a defensive firearm. So I uh, do a lot of dry fire and do a lot of practice. And then once you feel like you're just as fast or faster with the dot, then make your transition to the dot. But I would not recommend to anybody to buy a dot, stick it on your carry gun, and then hope that it's going to magic wand you out of trouble before you've put in the work to learn it. And oh, you mean I can't, I can't get sub-second A-zone hits and outrun my pistol on a plate rack? All it takes is time and money. All it takes is time and money <laughs> and a little bit of talent doesn't hurt either. <laughs> yeah. There's some guys that there's a couple guys I know that run red dots and I think they literally were born with a gun in their hand and were shooting since birth because there's guys that, that I've seen outrun their pistols on plate racks with red dots. And I'm like, how the hell are you doing this? So, um, so the, the advice that I would give, you're, you're going to learn how to shoot a dot this year, right? 2020 is your year to learn to yeah, shoot a dot? I'm hoping to, yeah. Okay. 2019 was my year to shoot a dot. A, a year ago, before I came on with Swamp Fox, I had never shot a pistol with a dot before. Um, I might have done it once at the range, trying out a friend's gun or something, but I had not ever even attempted to do it seriously. Um, and I decided that I was going to learn how to do it because... Um, I'm going to sell these products and I'm better at selling things if I actually use them and know how to use them. And, uh, and if I actually do the thing, I'm better at designing the thing, right? So it, be it became very important for me. Hey, I need to learn how to do this stuff. Um, I'm not just going to watch other guys do it well and say, well, I'm, I'm too old to learn how to shoot with a new system. Like I got to figure this stuff out, right? So I did a lot of dry fire. I did a lot of practice at the range. I worked on my presentation a lot. Um, and guess what? Now my shooting with iron sights is way better than it was. And my presentation with iron sights is way better than it was because of the work that I had to put in in order to get good with the dot. So it will force you to get better overall to do this. Um, let me give you one piece of advice real quick. So 
me back off of this a little bit. So here's my Glock. It's empty. So when you present, when you come up out of the holster, you don't want to come down like this and you don't want to come up like this. What you want to do is, as you come up and you, and you start to press out, get this window in your line of sight as soon as possible. So it, the window's in my line of sight. I can see through it. I'm, I'm actually left eye dominant. I'm cross dominant. So I'm going to actually do what I, what I really do. Me too. Yeah. So the, <laughs> before I draw, the first thing, the, the last thing I do before I draw is I do this. Yep. Yep. I noticed that <laughs> when we took a uh, defensive pistol class, me and him together, I noticed he was doing that. I'm like, what the hell are you doing? He goes, cross eye dominant. I was like, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Man. It's like the, uh, like the old Western, you know, <whistles> wah, wah, wah. Wah. Getting the, get, got to get the left eye lined up. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to align this, this window as best I can as I press out and make my presentation right? So I give myself as much time as possible to try to find the dot. If you come up like this or you come down like this or whatever, what happens is you're going to miss the dot. And then you see guys that miss the dot. What do they do? They start swirling it around. Oh, oh, there it is. I found it. Okay. I can start shooting now. If you find yourself swirling like this, then, then you're doing it wrong. Press out and find the dot as you press out. That's a big factor. Also, don't look for the dot. Look at the target. It's all target focused shooting and let the dot appear on the target instead of finding the dot and then trying to chase the dot to where the target is. Yep, I've heard a lot of people say that this year. And no, folks, he did not just point the gun at the internet. Yes. <laughs> it's an unloaded. He pointed it right at me. Hey, I, you know what? I, you know, if Karen was here, <laughs> that Karen that wants to speak to the manager, she'd probably be offended. Karen, we Karen, this is for you. Here. You can see the follower in my magazine, Karen. Do not call the police on me. Is that, is that, a, is that an, um, with the follower? Uh, I just, that's a whole, that's a whole nother episode for why people piss me off because they're affected by everything. No, actually, my question, uh, I do have a question with, like, is he talking about like, the presentation there? is um like like personally all of my carry pistols um especially like my work gun whenever i was doing my other job which was working housing as a patrol officer um for speed of acquisition there is that drawing uh, like i run excess big dots um what's like, like how would you say is the transition from this to an optic and, and the benefits of it well if you're going to compare big dots to uh to a, a red dot site, I would say, welcome to the world of shooting past 15 yards. It's amazing. Um, and then you're just there's a minion on the screen. At this point. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, it's worse in a second. oh, wait a minute. My wife wants to really you have to show the internet the bunny. Hey, hi. Oh, it's hello. Awesome. That's oh, it's a lion head. Yes, it's lion head. Oh, that, that, that's Karen. That. Hello, Karen. Well, his real name is Lemmy, but that yeah, is Karen. I need to speak to the manager because I have the I'm going to bitch everybody haircut. That is, Karen, that, that is the Karen buddy. Well, well, rabbit owning badasses of the world unite. I have two rabbits, Lancelot and uh, oh my God, that is a beautiful rabbit. Yeah, so Lancelot is my Netherland dwarf and Rogue is my uh, is my English spot because all Harley riding, gun toting badasses have to own rabbits. That's it's a thing. It's either rabbit or small dog. My dad, my dad owns a Chihuahua, so yeah. They, they don't bark all night for no reason. That, that dog doesn't bark unless you walk into the house and don't pet it. Like it's like pet me, or I'm gonna bark. Okay, pets, I'll go away now. But my rabbit has a cool name, so. So, yeah, your your rabbit is named after Lemmy Kilmeister from Motorhead. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> he does kind of look like Lemmy from Motorhead now that I think about it. It's a good point. I don't have any, out of all the animals we have, I don't have any normal named animals. We have, yeah, we totally brushed over the we have sheep. My little boy raises sheep. Um, we have Willow, Trinity, Ragnar, Ragnar and, and my wife named the one Lady Baba. 
that's good. And then we have a baby sheep just recently, which is named Leia after Princess Leia. I have Sid the Sloth the cat, Onyx, and then Lemmy the rabbit, and then soon to have a German Shepherd puppy uh, named Odin. So now we understand why you're interested in budget optics, because there's no way you're affording Night Force with all that shit, man. No. <laughs> Uh, no, no, I basically uh, have a small uh, ass farm. Yeah, a farm. Hold on, he has a farm. He has, yes, a small. Yeah, I mean it is very small. The, the nice part is, is we have a little bit of help for my son, sheep from my family. My dad and or my stepdad and mom kind of help him with them, but all the other animals are my responsibility. Well, let me let me finish off. Let me get serious with with John for a second. Um, so, John's asking me a question from a law enforcement officer's point of view, and so I want to answer it for you know my answer to a law enforcement officer. Um, and I would I would say this to anybody, right? So, why should a law enforcement officer learn how to use a dot instead of XS big dots? And I've run XS. I've I've run them on Glocks, so I have experience with them. XS, that system is a system for a defensive firearm, and that is a system that's uh, intended to be very fast um, at, at the distances where most handgun engagements take place, which is seven yards or closer, right? Um, most of your real-world handgun engagements are arm's length out to seven yards 99% of the time, right? And that's what XS big dots are for. Um, that's their selling point. From a law enforcement agent's point of view, if I was going to try to sell you on a dot instead of in, instead of any iron sights, especially the XS big dots, I'd, I'd give you two reasons. One, <clears throat> target-focused sighting. So the days of you having to look and focus on a front sight and, and focus on that are over. You can now focus on who is in your sights and you can watch their hands and you can maybe perceive is that a cell phone in the guy's hand or a pocket pistol in the guy's hand because you're watching him and you're focused on him and your eyesight isn't bouncing back and forth between front sight target front sight target front sight target front sight target and that sort of spastic holy shit i might have to take a shot at any moment and and i can only focus on one thing at a time we spend so much time focusing on the front sight and training to do that and then when officers getting to an officer involved shooting and they're doing the review process and they get interviewed about it and they say you know what did you see they either say well i focused on a front sight and so i i didn't really perceive what the suspect was doing at that moment because i was looking at my front sight or more often they say i don't remember seeing my sights at all i was just looking at the guy and i sort of body indexed it and went and you know and that other one was in court god awful yeah, and it, right. like, that's like either one of those would be, be, be terrible answers in court. <laughs> right. Um, and I'll, I, there's another thing I can circle back to regarding that. So, so yeah, you want to be able to tell a judge and maybe a jury, you know, hey, I was able to observe this guy at all times. I saw what he was doing with his hands. I saw him make a furtive gesture. And as his hand come up, I saw that it was a firearm and I already had a sight picture on him. And so I depress, you know, I, I, I pressed my trigger twice and, you know, I made the decision at that point to, to intervene and to take the shot. Right. So it, it makes for better testimony for sure. And you know how liability averse law enforcement is. They do so much based on, holy crap, we're going to get sued. How do we survive lawsuits? Cause you guys get sued no matter what you do. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> Don't be like the guy from I, Texas and put the your, your dust cover yeah. on you. Right. Like, right. Thank, thank God I've never, I've never had to actually shoot somebody, but like I've literally had to go to court over evictions. So yeah. Right. Just working in the house and dealing with that. <laughs> so, so that's part of it, right? So part two, the second part that I would like to talk about is the accuracy advantage on a dot site is extremely real. As your distance increases out to 15, 25, 50 yards, 100 yards, you can make shots with a dot much more easy 
that would be very, very difficult to perform on with, uh, with an excess big dot or really with any iron sight. Because well, we've got a three MOA red dot here. Your, your, your dot covers three inches of target at 100 yards. It doesn't obscure the target. You have such a finer aiming point. Now, what the chances of you needing a shot like that, traditional wisdom says, eh, law enforcement's never going to need a 100-yard shot. I know you want to say something. Go ahead. No, I was, I was, I was actually agreeing saying very low. Actually, what I'm thinking is that the last time I had to qualify, for instance, I think our longest shot was 25-ish yards. Now, to be fair, it was the first time the person giving the test had ever seen big dots on the range. And he laughed his butt off because they, I think we had, I don't know, 45 seconds to shoot our last string of shots. And I did it in about five. And I, he was like, he, he literally walked over to me immediately. He's like, you know, you had like, like, you still have like 41 seconds to finish, right? And I was like, okay. And then his, his son, who was helping with the test, wanted to shoot my gun afterwards. He'd never seen big dots before. And because I actually, I, I literally had the highest score in the class when I was qualifying, even though people say big dots aren't, you know, accurate enough to qualify with them. The watts and the distance that we use them for, it worked just fine. Um, and, but regardless, like I would never, 100 yards sounds like a very tall task. I would be fishing for that for a minute. Like, that would be a slow shot, I feel like. Though I feel oh, like yeah. I could probably do it at a slow shot. It, you know, if it's a slow shot for you, at least you, at least you are one of the guys who shoots enough to consider it to be a possible shot. Because there are a lot of guys out there, law enforcement or not, and, and under certain circumstances, I'm one of them, where, you know, I, take, I look at a 100-yard shot and I go, I can't take the shot. I have to close distance. And what, what we're talking about, let's just talk about it out, outright. I'm not afraid to say it. This, this is where we're in the nightmare scenario of a, an active shooter. Oh, my God, an active shooter in my small town. There's some jackass with an AK and, he, and a chest rig, and he's decided to shoot up City Hall because he didn't pay his parking ticket or whatever the hell his, his girlfriend beat him up the night before, whatever his problem with life is. And now I'm the guy that's on the spot, whether I got a badge or not. I'm the guy who has the gun and the ability and the responsibility to stop this asshole. Now, can I take a shot from 50 yards? Can I take a shot from 100 yards that's a, a legally defensible and, frankly, responsible shot? Can I take that shot? Or do I need to close distance, run up on this guy, and hope that I can get within 15 yards of him before I start opening fire and hope he doesn't notice me and hope he doesn't kill a bunch of people while my chubby butt is, is closing 75 yards of distance on him? Right, and I think I think that's my biggest part. That's where I do consider the red dot and scared the crap out of me. Honestly, is if nothing else, like I mean, one obviously the speed, as I mentioned, just because like I feel like for like I, just being on the range of big dots for a few, quite a few years now, and I feel confident with them that I feel like I'd be fishing for it for a second, and that really, and, and granted, a lot of times when I was doing the housing stuff, like when we knew there was problems where we thought like there was. XYZ going on in the world. We may need it. We had better equipment with us, we'll just say. Um, but I was always worried about like if there is that long distance, that worst case scenario, like that right. I want to take that out with a pistol. And that was the one thing that's always had kind of the red dot in my head as a possibility. I call it I call it low percentage, high stakes. Like the chances of it ever That's happening to exactly me are really small, but I better damn well be ready because if it does happen, I've already decided for me, I don't plan on surviving that situation. I don't, yeah. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever that, it takes to stop that guy, but I'm probably not going to live. That, then that, that's not, and, then, and at that point, that's not what you're worrying about. You're trying to stop the threat. That's what matters at that point. That's yeah. Yeah, obviously, yeah, that's, that's the only thing at that point. Is, I'm sorry that we went super dark here. Hey, why don't you talk to the gnome for a minute? Because I feel like we just wow. like brought this all to a kind of reality. <laughs> thanks, thanks. So, shut up. All right, so we pretty much are at the end, I think. Unless you have anything else you want to discuss, Mike, or one. Well, one one thing that I wanted to tie in on, actually, you guys were talking about. We were talking about low power variables, and um, and I was talking about 
the advantage of the dot being target focused sighting and that you can see your suspect better. You can see the guy that you're aiming a gun at better, right? Um, that's actually the draw for low power variables right now for law enforcement. There's a lot of law enforcement that is going away from red dots and going towards LPVO because of target identification. Because, um, you know, I can hit with a red dot at 200 yards. I've done it, right? Uh, you know, you set your zero right. You have a white painted steel torso target on a dark background and you can hit it 200 yards with a red dot. Sure. Can I identify a target in the dark, in low light? Um, can I see what they're carrying? Can I see what they're doing? Um, not so much. So the ability of my ability to hit is better than my ability to see what I'm aiming at. Right. And that's the nice thing about something like a one to 10 is that, even if I'm never gonna take a, a 400 yard shot as a police officer, I can move this, crank this sucker up, and I can see so much better. I can see what that guy's doing and if he really needs to be shot or not. Is he the guy that needs to be shot right now or am I aiming at the wrong dude? This guy is the guy that needs to be shot <laughs> just about every time. What? Well, that's, is that <laughs> a, a, in general, how many uh, sights are meant, like, you, I mean, like you, you use your sights to shoot, but optics are meant to see better, not necessarily to shoot better. Right. And uh, I think LPVOs are going to go a long way in law enforcement in the next five years. And I think in the next five years, pistol dots are going to go a long way in law enforcement as well. Um, I think, like I said, I, I chose last year to learn how to do it. And if you try it, I'd like to, I'd like to get a product in your hands and get you to try a dot out. And if you get 2000 rounds and some dry fire through a dot, I bet you're going to look at iron sights on pistols the same way I do. When I, when I shoot an iron sighted pistol now, a year, after doing it for a year, I'm sort of like, Oh, people still do it this way. That's kind of historic. Oh, you know, it's yeah. quaint. that's old school. Yeah. Now do, you, do any of the uh, pistol dots you folks have, are they able to be co-witnessed with like a standard height uh, pistol sight? No, you'll, you'll need suppressor sights. Nobody. Um, but those are getting way more affordable than they used to be and way more standardized than they used to be. So that used to be an exotic thing to have suppressor height sights on your gun. And now it's really not a big deal unless, I mean, even guns that are not necessarily that popular, there are aftermarket guys making suppressor height sights or, or dot sight heights for them. It's not that much of a challenge. But honestly, like on my test bed gun, on this 320, I don't have a rear iron sight on this. The rear iron yeah. sights are held that in. That was one of the first things I noticed. Yeah. I don't need it. What do I need an iron sight for? I, I change out the battery on this thing once a year. Every Christmas, I'll change the battery out. What do I need an iron sight for? See, John, you noticed the iron sight. I noticed the top, the top feeding battery tray. So I also doing that for some of them that was going to be on the side or something. I didn't even care. Like, I, like I, the first thing I was like, the, like, as soon as he showed that up the first time, I'm like, Where, where's, the, where's the rear sight? All right, it's gone. It you know, that's how you're running it. Yep. I got this is why this is why Zach's gonna buy a Block 45 MOS. I'm pretty sure because he's you know gonna make a smart decision, like Kevin. Yeah, but I can outshoot Kevin. I should hope so. I can outshoot Kevin one-handed. We'll see. You know, let's get you guys in the range, and we'll see. Okay. I've heard Pete Tack and many of them have said good things about him. Just saying. So pistol pistol shooting is like playing the tuba the more you put into it the more you get out of it you know i mean it's it's like anything else the more you the more that you try and the, then the harder you train the better you're going to be and if it just sits there in the safe uh, and it's in the sock drawer collecting dust then you're going to suck when the time comes that's that's the bottom line this is a perishable skill but you'll find that for me a pistol a, a red dot has the same advantages on a pistol or a shotgun that it has on an m4 carbine if you like a red dot on an M4 carbine, why would those advantages stop being true because it's on a shotgun or on a pistol? True. What holster do you run with the dot? Because I'm it's sorry. It's about the only one. For, for me, um, so 
uh, I've got it in a different room. Um, I can dig up the one that I actually carry and I'll give a shout out to my friend Tom Kelly while I do it. Hold on a second. Somebody eat the goddamn cookies. Ah, here you are. Eat your fucking cookies. While he's gone, just in my opinion, I threw this gauntlet a little bit as the, uh, for like duty pistols, it's like if you want like a level three or a level two, it can be very tricky. Um, this is one of the things, as I've looked into this over the last couple of years, um, I know Safari Land has, I believe, the SLS system, which will accommodate that. There is also the duty holster that I've used for years, which is the uh, is the IWI or the you know, SIGTAC, which was originally the Israeli weapons, whatever. Um, they have a level two that will accommodate red dots, but there's it, 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 there isn't a lot of great duty holsters. I'm sure that now, over time, the concealed carry and just regular as far as um, general purpose carry has probably come a long way. Um, I'm hoping in soon here we see a, a jump in the duty holster options as well. And shut up there, uh, goatee boy. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, right now for law enforcement, there it's really the safari land and the safari land and the safari land and then like a few a few oddballs, you know, um, custom guys and some low product number guys. But the safari land ALS is by far and away the standard. Um, and that's what we safari land? make sure the artists fit. Um, so what I'm carrying, when I'm carrying my 26 in, this is a holster um, from Dark Star Gear. My friend Tom Kelly makes these. This is a appendix carry holster. And uh, the secret of this thing is the wedge. Um, I was never able to carry appendix comfortably. It felt like a six-year-old child was digging their elbow into my, into my you know, hip. Uh, every time I tried to, to carry a appendix, I actually would bruise myself. I'd get bruises on my leg and I, I hated it. And, um, and then Tom, yeah, Tom got me, uh, this, this holster from him and, and said, put the wedge on it. So this is a soft foam wedge. Um, and this, this thing is amazing. Like I can ride my Harley from Houston to Fort Worth and be on the Harley for four hours carrying this the whole way. And I forget it's on like, it's one of those things where it's almost scary, like, oh, crap, I can't go to the bank. I just remember it. I'm carrying a Glock. I shouldn't go to the bank. <laughs> Oops. I mean, to, to, to go from... Never stop. Okay. Yeah. To go from bruising myself, in, to go from bruising myself to forgetting that I'm carrying a, a 12 plus one nine millimeter with a dot on it is pretty freaking phenomenal. Thank you, Tom. So, so what you're saying is, is if I see you at Pittsburgh International Airport, I probably should ask if you forgot that you have your pistol on you. I, I would appreciate that. Um, gotcha. And, and as far as the concealability aspect of it, I'll, I'll get myself set up here real quick. He's, he's giving himself a fair shake going off camera for us, so we can't see where he's putting it. That's good. Yeah, get your hand. <laughs> you see, I just went like this. Yeah, and yeah. Like, yeah, let's go for this. Oh. Oh, 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 oh no, no, he has his pistol on him. I was like, wait, what? <laughs> you get your hand. <laughs> yeah. Why the hell are you carrying at your? He's carrying at his twelve o'clock zipper line. No, I slid. I slid over when I sat down. Okay, hey, so different strokes. Sure. I've got my. Uh, yeah, this is my uh, uh, Ian McCollum at Forgotten Weapons. Oh, nice. what, do you, what do you do when you're caught between the Nazis and the commies? Awesome. Form a resistance movement. I like it. Polish resistance fighters. Yeah, Seems pretty, like pretty badass awesome. guys, and they've been forgotten, they right? So this is me. You know, I could walk around Walmart, go to the gas station or whatever. I mean, yeah, it's black, but it doesn't print at all. Damn. Right? That's it. It's all about the super pad. That's nice. So if you can't draw and get a sight picture faster than that, then a guy of my skill level will kill you. That's that's the reality of it. I think that's the part that's always oh, God, I just, the ideas. Yeah, that'd be it.
Do you have any more questions, John? Hey, I take this serious, guys. Yeah, and, yeah, uh, I mean, you know. I mean, yeah, honestly, you, you, I, think, I, think, I think you have to be caught in the buying one, um, which I'm glad my wife's already had me to my pills for the night and that uh, she's going to go to bed so she doesn't know what my next purchase is. But, yeah, I, I think Poor I'm going to have to. Yeah, I think, I think the red thing is happening this year. Uh, happening this year is my phone switches to dead battery mode. <laughs> nice. Um, I don't nice to meet you guys. Yeah, I think we got like our last. Uh, let's see, the last two yeah. questions. Um, the one question is like a three-part question. What's your favorite caliber? What's your favorite firearm? And what's your favorite optic? Which we're just gonna take out optics because, well, you work it's for an optic pretty company. Pretty simple. <laughs> okay. Um. Favorite firearm? Whew. And it can be anything, whatever. <laughs> He's like, wait a minute, I'm looking around here. I know. I, 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 it's like my, I can't. Don't don't make me choose between my children here. And it does. Um, it doesn't have to be one that you own. It could be whatever. Yeah. Okay. <sighs> Easy, children. <laughs> All right. So, if I could have anything, if I just, if I had, you know, trust fund baby money, and I was rolling around in my new Range Rover, I would get a Barrett M82, the M107, the semi-auto 50 cal. Yeah, that's that's a that's a holy grail gun right there. Who wouldn't want one of those things? Right. Yeah, I could use one. Yeah. yeah, it's I mean, like it's, how do we say that's the everyone. that's the gun that you get when you absolutely positively have to kill the motherfucker behind your neighbor's fridge in the next zip code. They'll thank me later. That was a necessary shot. He was gonna make a move. <laughs> Their three thousand dollar fridge may be destroyed, but that guy was there to hurt somebody. <laughs> yeah, what a what a fantastic just and how America is that thing. It's just so. I mean, we, we take for granted, guys, that we have the ability to buy these things and use them in a responsible manner and to, to have that liberty and that freedom. We just, oh, yeah, anybody can buy a 50 cal if you got the money. You know how crazy that sounds to the rest of the world? You know how bad they want that? You know how bad the people in Hong Kong would like to have some Barrett A-82s right now? Yeah, but we want, their, we want their full auto AKs that they can get. Yeah. <laughs> It's a fair uh, trade-off. If, 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 you, if, if you work for fucking Kim Jong-un or whatever, you can get it. Yeah, true. While you're working for um, the you can't kill anyone in the next zip code for free. True. true. <laughs> I'd say uh, my favorite caliber is, uh, is 9 millimeter because it's cheap and effective. Uh, there, are, there are handgun calibers that are arguably more powerful. You know, everybody likes 10 millimeter. Oh, 10 millimeter. Cool. You know, uh, uh, and I, I like 45 ACP. I want to, I like 1911s. You know, I got a couple of 1911s. Two world wars. Yeah. But uh, two world go. wars. <laughs> uh, I love shooting 1911s. 1911s are so much fun, but they're, it's so much more expensive to get good with a 1911. Um, you know, People think guns are expensive. Guns are not the expensive part. Getting good with your guns is the expensive part. Yes. Taking classes, going to the range, buying the right equipment, breaking that equipment, rebuying better equipment. That's the part that costs money. The, the gun itself is not that expensive. And ammo, over time, it adds up. Nine millimeter is cheap, and it gets the job done. So I'm a nine millimeter guy. Two, three. Um, so the last question, and... Um, well, we've been just asking everybody. So the last question is, did Jeffrey Epstein hang himself? Are you kidding? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> <laughs> that has been everybody's reaction so far. <laughs> well, I mean, I was born under a rock, but not yesterday. I, I, Come I, on. Think, I think I'll be playing the Epstein question that. for the foreseeable future. Yeah. Um, with that, um, where can everybody find you guys, Swamp Fox Optics at? Worldwideweb.swampfoxoptics.com. We're uh, we're pretty active on Facebook, and we're active on AR15.com, and we're active on Instagram. 
So yes, you guys are because I've been topics anywhere those places. You guys have definitely been active, especially this week and with the after shot show. You guys have been really active. Um, other than that, I don't think we got anything else. You guys got anything? You, John, you got anything? No, we're good. Um, I agree. I agree on the nine millimeter. Ooh, yeah. what is so, this? Stay tuned for more cool things from Swamp Box. Ooh. And notice, notice this. This thing got accidentally dropped big time off of a uh, off of a table at a media shoot. Hard enough that it broke the rifle that it was on, and the rifle it has to be repaired. And this held zero. This is damn. Wow. Wow. So we got some cool things in the pipe. Nice. I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye. Yeah, definitely. I'm in the market. Um, with that, folks, uh, Mike, if you want to hang out for a couple minutes after we finish our uh, show, we can BS a little bit more. Um, folks, definitely go check out Swamp Fox Optics. Um, thank you again for coming on, Mike. We appreciate it. Uh, sorry we had to reschedule from last week to this week. I was recovering from slight sinus infection. Um, no, it's been fun, guys. It's been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Um, that's about it for this yep. episode, guys. Um, got anything, man? No. Just... Other than that, folks, stay tuned. Uh, we're possibly going to have one with 5150 rifles. We're going to have one with Sons of Liberty and also with Facts on Firearms coming up. Uh, I'll be doing a review hopefully this week as long as my trigger finger keeps working. Uh, for our Manus X that they had uh, sent us. Um, oh, yeah. This guy. Oh. This guy came back on. Uh, oh, hi. The other Euro persuasion, Asian impression, whatever I called you on the first episode. Mr. Cox Asian? is back. Yes, you look Asian. Um, wow. wow. But uh, uh, so um, stay tuned, guys. We're going to be doing a lot of shooting this year. and. Um, also, make sure you check out our uh, episode sponsor. I don't know if it, it was this episode. It was the last anyway, one. But it was the last one. But anyways, check out uh, Ash Hess's company, Quantified Performance. Uh, they just had their uh, first shoot of the year this year down in the arena training facility. Um, they've seen a couple of videos today? from it. Yeah, it was actually today. Um, they were playing in the rain, yeah. in the water. So make sure you guys check them out. Um, make sure you check Swamp Fox Optics out. Make sure you check all the other companies that we tag in our posts out. Other than that, I'm Zach the Tactical Gnome. Keep the beard to tank. Daddy Brigade Podcast out.